So where does the WebGL spec stand? Uh, as Neil mentioned, a year ago, WebGL 1.0 came out, and it was a good step, but there, it, it was rushed toward the end, and the performance test had some corner cases that really weren't covered for all of the hardware that's out there that we intend WebGL to run on. So um, there was a lot of undefined behavior, and people were running into this, and so it was very, very difficult for any WebGL implementation to actually pass the conformance test and then say, okay, this is a compliance implementation. We guarantee that it's going to behave identically across a range of platforms for certain kinds of inputs. So um, Greg Tavares in particular, my colleague at Google, uh, has done an enormous amount of work on the WebGL conformance tests over the past year. And the test suite is really been built out with tons of tests in there. Uh, a lot of tests actually thanks to the OpenGLBS 2.0 working group. And, uh, and in addition, a lot of the corner case behavior has either been identified and defined or uh, basically fixed and, and hidden in such a way that the behavior is now identical across both desktop and mobile hardware. So the, the conformance tests are in really good shape at this point. And, um, the spec has been submitted to the Kronos board uh, for approval. Within probably five weeks, it's uh, slated to be voted on and approved. And then we're going to have a WebGL 1.0.1, and that is actually going to be implementable. And so you're going to be able to do canvas.getcontext.webgl, and that's going to start working. It's, it's an exciting step. It's maybe a bit of a, a symbolic step, but it is important to think, because it means that you know, we're going to guarantee that it's going to work in a certain way going forward. Um, the type to race spec has uh, been very interesting. Uh, the evolution has been very interesting. So this spec was the precursor almost to WebGL. The minute that we started to do WebGL, we said, well, there's no way to efficiently take numbers from JavaScript and upload them to the graphics card. So we had to back up and figure out how to do that. And so the type to race spec came out, and we first had WebGL float array, and then that turned into float32 array, and then that got split off in the WebGL spec, and now it's its own spec. It's been picked up in XML HTTP request, it's been picked up in a file spec, it's been picked up in, uh, in a, a bunch of different web standards. It's actually been folded back into the Canvas spec. So now if you do get image data from a Canvas tag, what's coming back as the data array is not anymore a Canvas pixel array, it's actually a, a typed array from the Chrono spec, which is pretty cool. So Overall, the, the impact that this uh, work has had on the web is already significant, and I anticipate that it's going to become even greater in the future, and I'm really looking forward to that. Um, so by way of uh, showing off some stuff, I guess, is everybody pretty much familiar with learningwebgl.com? Anybody not ever heard of it? First time seeing it on the screen? Okay, well, all right, that's good, that's good. So I um, can highly recommend this. Uh, this is done by, uh, I believe it's Giles Davis, and um, I'm, no, I'm sure he got his name wrong. Thomas. 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 Yeah. What am I thinking? Giles Thomas, and um, he, he just collects all the WebGL stuff that's out there on the net, puts it in one place that you can go to and easily find it. It's great. So I want to show a couple of uh, cool demos that are both on his site and not. This is one done by a colleague. Oh no, wrong, wrong <laughs> network. Ah. Let's get back on the Zoom. He's giving me an IP address. If you're on it, because we have limited five people. So if you want to disconnect, I think I think we're good. Yes. Okay. So uh, my colleague Omari Haikenen, who was actually a very early contributor to the WebGL working group, uh, he, he developed some of the early performance tests, is now um, in the developer relations group. He, uh, he's a developer advocate at Google. And he likes to make cool WebGL demos. So this is one where he's showing a million letters rendered using WebGL. There's so many that you can't even see them all. <laughs> and of course, then you can start to do some real you know, psychedelic stuff because it's all GPU accelerated. Right, so you can do you know GPU accelerated rainbow effects, you know, warping the position of each one. You can of course, uh, if we, you can see that you can. How are the letters rendered? The, the letters, letter table? the letters are textured. It's a, a big texture atlas, okay. and so it's one quad per letter. Okay, so it's pretty pretty simple technique. It's not doing any you know, really super fancy. No kerning or anything. Like no kerning. Um, no uh, no anti-aliasing of you know LCE subpixel anti-aliasing or anything like that. So it's pretty simple, but it, it's effective. Um, here's showing that we can you know easily touch every letter in the uh, in the book very very quickly and interactive reads. 
and he had the, the SOPA mode, which I thought was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> but once SOPA got shut down in uh, Congress, it had to be <laughs> renamed to the censor mode. But anyway, um, this one's up on his website, fhtr.org, which I guess was supposed to be in the uh, future, but it uh, doesn't read quite like that. Um, and, and so you can pick apart the source code and see how to do this kind of stuff. It's not that hard. All right, now this is super cool. Have you guys seen this yet? It's EVE Online's spaceships rendered in a web page using WebGL. They should yeah. totally redo EVE Online to be a WebGL. Yeah, yeah. That would be pretty cool. Yes. Yeah. No. Actually, a, a colleague of mine was like, why did you have to send this out? You know that I'm just going to waste all my time on this <laughs> and never do any more work again, again ever. ever. <laughs> all right, but I mean, look at the detail on this thing. It's really, really it's good. good. It's super fast. I mean, this is 60 frames a second, silky smooth, and it's just a web browser. This runs the same everywhere. That's what's cool. You write it once, you deploy it on the web, and then you don't have to write an iPhone, OS, or Android application for it. Um, I want to show a couple of other demos that are off of um, learning WebGL. This is pretty awesome. It's a, it's a, a diffusion simulation, fluid dynamic simulation, that's running entirely on the GPU using WebGL. Check this out. This is gorgeous, right? Look at the detail on this. And the thing is, you can stir it up to uh -huh. All right, and then it does like all these turbulence effects. So it looks like alien skin as it's sitting you know, closer to the camera. And I think, here, let's try Street View. This might totally die, but. <laughs> yeah. Internet through a straw. Thanks, Verizon. Parallel um, <laughs> <laughs> TV? Yes, it's amazing. Um, <laughs> Limited transmute. <laughs> But you can see like the super cool swoop in stuff, and, and if we can get some of the, um, yeah, okay, yeah, check this out. Even the street view motion is smoother. Okay, so if we come down here and go down on the parallel, do you see that? Yeah. It's actually geometry based interpolation between the viewpoints. Cool. This is like research. This is coming out right from Google Labs and going into the product. Cool. And it takes a while for the, you know, right now for the next mm -hmm. set of images to show up, but I mean, just the, the, the motion of it is so much better. It's yeah. amazing. So, uh, getting back to extensions, trying to figure out what extensions to add and uh, what functionality to add to the core spec. The two things that we're thinking of adding are resource sharing between WebGL contexts, so you can have two different canvases on the web page that are rendering the same scene. Is it really useful? I mean, I don't know. Okay, I see some nots. Who would use it if that were in there? All right. Uh, good. That's that's good to know that you know a significant percentage of developers actually want to see that. Yeah, that's useful. Um, another. Corollary from that functionality would be that you might be able to get WebGL rendering and working threads. And if you could do that, then you could do like downloading of textures and a completely background thread and then upload them to the GPU and then send a, a brief message to the main thread saying, all right, texture is ready now. And then the main thread can actually render it with no hiccups in your frame rate. And that is, is very important for AAA titles among other applications. Um, can you talk about the new data sharing stuff? I forgot what it was called. Transferable support. Transferable support. Again. Yeah, so this is another interesting thing. Um, we wanted to speed up applications like this one. Um, oh, I should have I should have totally put this on the board. First need to speed up the internet. Yeah. <laughs> this is no reflection on you know anybody, it's just Verizon. I assume it's Verizon. Yeah, there we go. Uh, I wonder if I have this on here. This is just blowing me data plan. Yeah, I know. You're going to get like a $500 plan bill. <laughs> okay. There we go. So uh, this demonstration is one that is very, very old and is by NVIDIA from 2000, I don't even remember, 2? 2003? So, it's, um, it's showing CPU side vertex generation in real time. Okay, so every dot that you see there is actually a 3D vertex computed in JavaScript every frame. There's no geometry caching going on here. And it's, it's intended to show what you can do with deformable geometry. And what we've been trying to do is figure out if you had a really, a really computationally intensive uh, geometry generation process, or you had physics going on, and you needed to either parallelize it or at least get it off the main thread, could you send the results efficiently from that worker thread back to the main thread for processing or visualization? 
<coughs> and in JavaScript, up until fairly recently, the answer was no, you can't do that. Because the, um, there, there's a semantic in the JavaScript language that says you cannot see any outside influences on your program or its data. So you can't have like another thread you know, poking at your data asynchronously. Uh, and the, because of that, there, there is no sharing of resources between a main thread and JavaScript order thread. And when you want to send data from one to the other, you have to copy it always. So we realized, all right, this is a major problem. Now how can we how can we address it? So there was some discussion on public mailing lists, and the typed array spec came to the rescue because it already described having a, a large block of data that you're working upon, and we wanted to say, all right, I just want to give that to the other side, and then have the other side work on it, and then give it back to me, and then give it back to the other side. So basically, being able to ping pong uh, writable data between worker threads. So we spec'd it with a lot of help from a lot of individuals. We even got Microsoft to say, yes, this is a good idea. And um, it's been added to the HTML5 specification, and the functionality is now implemented in Chrome. And it's coming in Firefox, from what I hear. I talked to Dave Herman and some of the other guys that are working on this stuff. So with the typed array spec and web workers, you can begin to do real heavy data parallel applications in JavaScript, at least to the limits of JavaScript performance as they stand today. And I'm pretty excited about where that's going to go. Um, and maybe to wrap up, I should also mention that it's very interesting that the IE10 platform preview 2, I think, has support for typed arrays, <laughs> which is a very interesting fact, because they don't support WebGL, and they've come out publicly saying that they're very concerned about the security properties of the WebGL API, but yet they support the basic, you know, low-level primitive API that it's built on, and they've showed some demonstrations like, hey, look, we can download a JPEG image, and then we can show you a hex editor containing the bytes of that JPEG, which is not the most useful kind of application. But you may assume that maybe someday there may be something more interesting. Dr. Uh, Ray's for Silverlight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they, they can Silverlight. Silverlight is on the way out. Flash is on the way out. So what is there left? WebGL for the win. Dun, dun, dun. All right. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's why. Thanks everyone to all our presenters and demoers. I have a question. Yes. Oh, um, question. Sorry. I, I saw that uh, some of the, the 3D model was done by Sketch, Google Sketch. So is this Google Sketch now support WebGL? Are you hinting that? Or? SketchUp doesn't yet support WebGL. Okay. okay. So that's totally different. Yeah, it's a different product. Uh, it, I think it would be great if you could view 3D warehouse models interactively on the web using WebGL, but right now the feature isn't there. All you need is good Colada support in your run times. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> so you can show those models on your own website. Yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> any other questions for Ken? Sorry, I didn't mean so to cut you off. Microsoft security concerns. You want to give an update on that? Yeah, the actually, reality. I would. Thanks. Um, yeah. So, the, the no, okay, let, let me point out one thing. The WebGL spec and you know the GLSL ES spec and some of the restrictions that have been put in place by WebGL on these low level specs. They imply that it is not possible to access memory, uh, out of range memory, okay? You cannot do it, you can't express it in the language, in the GLSL language, for example. You can't, you know, go past the end of incoming uniform arrays or your variants or stuff. The shader translator is supposed to catch this, whether or not it actually does is another question, but it, it will, okay, and there will be conformance tests verifying that this cannot happen. So, this means that it's safe from the point of memory accesses, because the shading language is simple. Relatively speaking, um, and the other APIs like uh, indexed geometry rendering, we actually have safeguard code in the browsers that make sure that you can't, you know, access random memory, and crash a web browser, and stuff like that. So, from that standpoint, the WebGL spec is secure. Okay. The other issue is can content either accidentally or deliberately lock up your machine because it, it does something really bad on the GPU. This is unfortunately a little all too easy to do. All you have to do is set up a big, big batch geometry with a fairly complex shader, or even a simple shader, and just render it, and your machine will go, and then like two minutes later, maybe it'll, you know, reboot spontaneous. I don't know. <laughs> so it's, it's, um, so it, what, what has been done? On Windows, you can't actually lock up the computer. The, uh, in Windows Vista, 
Okay. Well, uh, you, you can do it for two seconds, and then, uh, well, if you have another demonstration that shows locking up a Windows Vista or later machine with this kind of content, I'd like to see it. I can do an OpenCL. An OpenCL, not WebGL. Okay, so I'm stating definitively for WebGL that <laughs> you can't do that. That's, that's interesting. interesting. That's that's that. I think, yes, I think you have another interesting thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, basically, Microsoft realized that the, the graphics drivers were one of the number, one of the primary reasons why people felt that Windows was unstable. So they, in Vista, they re-architected the driver models that they'd be able to kill the graphics driver and restart it without taking down the whole system. And so as of Vista and later, you'll get something called the timeout detection recovery event, where it'll basically, two seconds into a particular draw call, it'll just like kill the, the graphics device, bring it back up and say, you know, the NVIDIA driver was restarted. Not, not, uh, not, <laughs> uh, it's not the kind of NVIDIA, it's just a problem with the, the application. Sure, but, um, or the Intel driver was restarted, or, or the AMD driver was restarted, just to have coverage in the industry. And, um, and then it recovered. Okay, so the, and then your, your graphics is working again. So we've already, in WebGL implementations, wired up these kind of events to the, to the implementations that and, and be, are beginning to put down safeguards that if the web page does this, it's not going to be able to just keep spewing graphics commands uh, through WebGL. And it's been great to have collaboration in both the OpenGL and the OpenGL ES working groups in Kronos uh, by the, the GPU vendors that are in agreement that yes, this is a problem, it's been a long-standing problem in graphics drivers in the graphics industry where there isn't enough robustness in the driver itself and we're providing application level hooks for detecting GPU resets and recovering from them. And it's been, the, the progress has been really good here. Um, I, I would guess that within the next three to six months, the browsers are really going to be rock solid when the driver support is there. And the driver support is already coming out on, on desktop machines and even on mobile hardware. So um, a lot of good progress there. And I think that this is really, in the end, the, you know, the last major problem for robust WebGL deployment everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, so Microsoft you know, was shooting bullets at us on their public security blogs, but not really getting to the heart of the problem. And what we're trying to do in the WebGL working group in Kronos is actually get to the heart of the problem and fix it for the entire industry. And then I think we've got a, a great future for um, just tons of cool content coming out on every device ever. So, yep. Anybody else? All right, great. Thanks for being here. Thank you all the presenters, demoers, and there's Damon, my co-chair, he wasn't around earlier, so we run the SF-based uh, WebGL meetups. Come talk to us if you have an idea for a presentation, you want to come and hang out and meet people in a more nighttime and pizza and beers kind of setting. Uh, next uh, featured folk, folks are going to be uh, David over there, David Sheets, showing off Glock again in more detail. With better demos. Yeah, better demos and throwing down uh, you know, some major, major uh, beats. <laughs> With his, uh, with his application he's working on. And that's going to happen sometime in the next two to four weeks. We have to set things up. We had this uh, opportunity here to do this with Kronos at, at the suite here, so we uh, sort of moved our schedule around. But that should be happening either, yeah, probably at this point, early April. We'll, uh, make sure you're on that meetup group page and, and all that information gets posted there. Uh, we have the room till 6 for this meetup, so you can feel free to drink and mingle some more, show some more demos if you have more of each other uh, individually. And, and thanks again, everyone. We'll see you soon. Well, thanks, Thank you.